Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart here be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, and I, my name is Bob Thompson, and I am an Eagle Scout. I'm going to l- deliver the sermon today, unless one of you would like to. <laughs> Being a Boy Scout was an important part of my growing up. Becoming an Eagle Scout helped shape me into the person I am today. And I know for those of you who were part of Boy Scouts and Girl, Scout, Girl Scouts, it helped shape you and gave you the character that you have today. One of the trademarks of both organizations is helping others. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts each say an oath, a promise, to help other people at all times. The Boy Scouts of America began because of one person helping a neighbor. It was a Good Samaritan story. In 1909, W.D. Boyce was an American newspaper man, and the legend has it that he was lost in London in a deep fog, unable to find his way. Well, along came a Boy Scout and guided him to his destination. The Scout refused to take a tip, saying he couldn't because he was just doing his duty as a Scout. Helping our neighbors seems to be a basic moral code that people are called to live by. In the newspaper recently, a young man in Cheyenne discovered the joy of helping a neighbor when he raked his neighbor's leaves. Now he's inviting all of his friends to do that also. As children, many of us first became aware of what it means to be a neighbor by watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and familiar with that phrase, won't you be my neighbor? The code of living by and helping our neighbors is a foundation for our country, coming from our Judeo-Christian foundation and a foundation for our Christian faith. In this passage, Jesus not only teaches us to love our neighbors, He also illustrates who is my neighbor and how to be a neighbor. This is perhaps the most famous story in the Bible, both within the church and in the secular world. Helping someone, in particular helping someone who you do not know, is called being a good Samaritan. States have laws that protect people who help others. They're called good Samaritan laws. But before we get to the story today, I want to first focus on the initial conversation between Jesus and this lawyer. This passage starts with a not-so-flattering account of a lawyer. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Okay, you can insert your favorite lawyer joke here. I was going to tell you a lawyer joke, but I decided to remain silent on the advice of my lawyer. (laughs) We like to make lawyer jokes, don't we? But isn't it nice when you have a legal question to know you can go to someone who knows the law, who you can call and get an expert answer on what the law is, what your rights are? Well, in this story, we meet a religious lawyer, the law of following God. He's an expert on that law. He knows the Bible, every word of it. He knows all about God, and he wants to test Jesus to see if he really knows what the experts, the true religious ones like himself, know. So the lawyer asked Jesus, what must he do to inherit eternal life? The sense is that he already knows the answer. He's not asking in a seeking way. He's asking in a fill-in-the-blank test sort of way to see if Jesus knows the answer. That the lawyer already knows what the answer is, is confirmed. When Jesus asks him, what is written in the law? What is there? And he gives the correct answer. It's an interesting question, isn't it? What must we do to inherit eternal life, to be saved? What must I do? Shouldn't we be asking, what must I believe? Aren't we always hearing that we just have to have faith in Jesus? Isn't that the message of John 3.16? Whoever believes will be saved. Wasn't the Reformation all about through grace we will be saved through faith and not by what we do, by our works? This seems to be a wrong question. But here Jesus indicates it's a legitimate question and it has a right and practical answer. Notice that twice in this passage Jesus says, go and do this. Both are true. Yes, we are saved by grace 
through faith in Jesus Christ. But what we do in our lives also matters. Doing is the work of believing. It is what the people of God do. It's what disciples of Jesus do. The lawyer asked, what must he do? And Jesus tells him to do it. Yes, we live by our faith. We demonstrate our faith by what we do. So what do we do according to this passage? The lawyer was right. Simply put, love God and love our neighbors. The first part of his answer is a well-known phrase from Deuteronomy. It's called the Shema, and it's still re recited by Jews every day. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. The second part of his answer is from Leviticus, to love your neighbor as yourself. The scripture that Jeremiah read today, this morning, illustrates how important loving a neighbor is in the Jewish faith. It calls us to open our hands and to help a neighbor in need. It warns us also to not to do so with a belligerent heart or with an uh, attitude of begrudgingly. Loving our neighbor involves not only doing something, but also having the right attitude when we help. We can't love our neighbor while also having negative thoughts and attitudes about them. But now the lawyer in our story wants to get specific. Well, okay, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And more importantly, who is not my neighbor? Who do I have to love and who do I not have to love? Before we criticize the lawyer for trying to set up a limit on who he has to love, we need to hold up a mirror to see how we respond to this command. Where do we draw the line on who we will help, who we won't? Are there limits to who we'll share our love with, whom we say God will love? Well, to demonstrate how limitless and how broad our love for neighbor is to be, Jesus tells the Good Samaritan story. But the story also answers the question of how to love our neighbor. At the end of the passage, Jesus asked the lawyer who the neighbor was in the story. The answer, the one who showed mercy. To which Jesus replied, go and do likewise. What does it mean to be a neighbor? To love a neighbor? It's to go and show mercy. So let's look at the story and see how it tells us how to show mercy. You know the story. A man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho when he is attacked by robbers who take not only his money but everything else and leave him half dead. Two religious leaders, a priest and a Levite, come by and they walk by on the other side of the road. They do not help. Then the Samaritan comes along and it says this, When he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. When the Samaritan saw the man, the beaten traveler beside the side of the road, he was moved with pity, with compassion. This is an important detail in this story. He acted out of compassion, not out of duty, not out of a hope for a reward or some form of karma where he'll get good back coming back to him, not out of wanting to impress anyone, not out of being called a hero. We also know he did not do it out of kinship. These two men, one Jewish, the other Samaritan, would have been considered enemies. He acted out of pity and compassion. It's interesting to note that it's not just that he felt compassion. It's possible that the priest and the Levite also felt compassion. They may have prayed for the, for the person, but the Samaritan man was moved by compassion. He felt it and he acted on it. The Samaritan man went to him. This, of course, would have shocked Jesus' hearers for a couple reasons. First, as I mentioned, these two races were enemies. You did not interact with one another. You didn't help. So the Samaritan acted out of the social norm. 
He most certainly went out of his comfort zone to help this man. Second, he also demonstrated in the story a risking of his own life by stopping. He could have also become a victim of the robbers. It was known that they used decoys sometimes to get travelers to stop, and then they would attack him. So putting aside his personal feelings, putting aside his personal safety, the Samaritan went to the man, bandaged his wounds, put oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. The next day he gave his own money, two denarii, roughly two days' worth of wages, to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. I'll repay you whatever else it costs you when I return. Think about the details of this Good Samaritan story. We often rush to it, through it because we know who the good neighbor is. But we need to hear the details of the story to see how we are to love our neighbor. First, he used what supplies he had, wine to cleanse his wounds, oil to soothe them. Then he put the person on his own animal, meaning he would now have to walk the rest of the way. He took him to an inn and stayed to care for him. He paid for his care with a promise to return and pay more. He used his own resources, his own time. He gave out of his own pocket and went out of his way to help this man. To love a neighbor, to love a God, implies being generous. Giving of ourselves and our treasures in a sacrificial way. Sacrificial giving is the love that God has for us, modeled for us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins. Think about the sacrifices that the Samaritan made. What did the Samaritan miss in his life or was late to because he took time to help this man? Surely he would have had plans. Surely he was busy. But he took time out of his own schedule, set that aside to help the man indeed. What were his financial needs as a Samaritan? Surely he had plans for this money. I wonder what he didn't buy for his family or for himself with this money. It's really remarkable what the Samaritan man did. And there's a name for it. It's called showing mercy. That's what it means to love our neighbors. Here's how Matthew wrote it in his gospel. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's the golden rule. Put yourself in the shoes of the injured man. How would you have wanted someone to be help you? How would you have wanted to be treated? Loving our neighbor, showing mercy, is treating others the way we would like to be treated, no matter what their status is, whoever they are. So the story is about a man who goes out of his way to treat someone in the way he would want to be treated. It's always challenging to read this Good Samaritan story, isn't it? He seems to set a pretty high standard for us. The Good Samaritan forces us to examine our own actions. Whenever I see someone in need, I think of the Good Samaritan and this story. And any excuse I can think of not to help is dismissed by his actions. So I feel guilty if I don't help. Loving our neighbor can feel overwhelming because so many people are in need so often. It's an impossible task to help them all. Sometimes I wish this story wasn't in the Bible, or I had never read it, or I could dismiss Jesus' words, but I can't, and that's good. God calls us to continually examine our lives to see how we are loving God and loving our neighbor. As we enter Lent on this Ash Wednesday, we are called during the season of Lent to examine ourselves, to see how we fail to love God or to love our neighbors. The story of the Good Samaritan challenges us to love our neighbor and to recognize everyone as our neighbor. It challenges us to go out of our way to treat people in the way we would like to be treated. It may not be easy, but discipleship never is. But it is our calling. The lawyer knew the right answer to have eternal life. He knows the right thing to do. The question we are left is, does he do it? 
Does he go and live showing mercy to others? Will he go out of his way to treat others the way he would like to be treated, no matter who they are? We also know the right answer. We are also left with Jesus' command, go and do likewise. And we are left with the same question, will we? Will we go and show mercy to our neighbor? The passage began with the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We find eternal life by loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. The Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts have made a promise, a promise to help other people at all times. May God help us all to do so. Amen.